Welcome. My name is Ben Joseph. I'm a retired uh, Vermont trial judge. This is the uh, Judge Ben Show. I record an interview about once a month. As it happens today, I'm doing two in one day, which is very unusual. It's also unusual because I usually do this in the studio at, uh, what is it, 259 North Winooski, 239, which is the uh, town meeting television. And uh, because of the COVID uh, virus problems, we can't use the studio. So we're using Battery Park, and uh, we've been blessed today with beautiful weather. And I'm very fortunate to have Karen Franzgard Scott back. I did an interview with her recently that I thought was one of the best ones I've ever had. Thank you very much. Thank it was you. really good. So I invited her back, and there were some other things I wanted to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. And uh, Karen sent me a note. I just want to read part of this and then go okay. into it, okay? <laughs> I just thought it was it's just a terrific terrific note. You and I both know that each story, each survivor, and especially survivors from traditionally marginalized communities, these are all so complex and different. We, paren, I mean me and my ilk, <laughs> I like that, create a generalized story about domestic violence, perpetrators, and survivors that really describes the experiences of very small white impoverished family. And we built an entire response system on this story. This is why the majority of survivors not only avoid accessing the criminal justice system, but avoid accessing the system in which I work. Okay, well, my guest Karen is the executive director of the Vermont Network Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Big job, you've had it for 13 years? 13 years. 13 years. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I was, more power to you, kid. And then you go on here to say we're at a crossroads. We are in the midst of a transformative moment where we actually are listening to the voices of marginalized survivors. And they are telling us that some parts of our system are great and work well, but some of the system is not really useful to them. Right? Together, we are acknowledging that survivors, as well as perpetrators, need many more options for intervention beyond in addition to the criminal justice system. And we are acknowledging we have ascribed a singular approach and an ideology that erases them. Um, so, so it was eloquent, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. No, really, it's right on. I'm, um, so, I, do a I did your topic outline. I do one for every one of these shows because I want to kind of keep track of what I wanted to ask about. I also want the people who are guests here to be comfortable and they know what they're going to be talking that. about. So and then I start with a real big question. How should society deal with perpetrators who use violence and coercion, coercion in their relationships? What should we do in Vermont? What do you think? Well, you know, as I said in my, my email to you, Ben, um, we, we have, for, for a really long period of time, about 30 years, we've really invested in one pathway for people who cause harm in their intimate partner relationships as well as for their victims. And that's really a pathway that, that um, pushes people into the criminal justice system. We often hear from survivors that enter the criminal justice system that it's a poor fit. It's not an indictment of the system. It's, it's just that it's, we're asking the criminal justice system to do something that's, that it's not really designed to do. Mm -hmm. For some survivors, access to the criminal justice system is vitally important and it could be a matter of life and death. So when I talk about we're at a crossroads and we really need to th think about different pathways, I'm thinking about addi additional pathways, mm -hmm. not necessarily shutting down one pathway to open up another pathway. That's been the mistake of our past, is just taking, just opening this one door when survivors need so many doors. You know, we were talking earlier about the complexity and um, individual, uh, the complexity of each individual case that you saw when you were on the bench. Each survivor that I've ever talked to has their lives are they're uniquely their own, and their situation is unique to them. And, um, and I've often felt like we were trying to, in helping survivors, we're trying to you know push a square peg into a round hole. So, you know what we're looking at in terms of how do we keep, how do we make our families safer, how do we, safer, how do we make our communities safer? There's great wisdom in talking to the people who have experienced harm, as well as the people who have caused harm. 
And so we're starting to have those conversations. And what we've heard, you've heard this, I've heard this for years and years from survivors is, I don't want him to go to jail. I want him to stop hitting us. And we have, we've pretty regularly pushed folks into, into jail, regardless of what that survivor wants. There have been situations where, uh, you know, the, the well, opposite is true. Sometimes that's appropriate. Of, of course, and sometimes, you know, I've spent a whole lot of my career uh, kind of in a protest mode, protesting folks that had demonstrated they were pretty dangerous, mm -hmm. who didn't go to jail. Yeah. So, so you know, this is again, this is a really complex issue. The one thing that I was, I've been thinking about so much lately is how far down the river we are by the time we get to the criminal justice system as, yeah. as, a, as a society and as a community. By the time the police are called, there's been, a, there's been a, an inordinate amount of coercion and violence in a relationship, with it, typically in a relationship where there's violence. It's involved the whole family unit and sometimes members of the community. And we actually, if we want to really hand, I think we want to get to the root of your question, we have to be further up the river. We have to be really thinking about how do we create a society where we never get to the place where somebody has to call the police for safety, where we have interventions much earlier mm -hmm. and, we have, and we're doing good prevention work. But, well, my, my constant, uh, thought on all this um, is I think it would be very nice to somehow change the culture. Yeah. To get, you know. I think that would be very nice too. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. That, that, that people shouldn't be understanding about a guy who beats up his, his wife. You know, that, mm -hmm. that there, there are, <laughs> it, it's not okay. And the, the culture has tolerated violence. Well, we live in a culture that tolerates violence. We yeah. live in a culture that sees violence as a legitimate means for solving problems. I mean, just think of the news headlines this week. <laughs> the, um, you know, where we have a 17-year-old shooting into a crowd of protesters with an assault rifle. The, and, and we have real strengths in our culture as well. We have a vision for what a more peaceful culture could look like. And it will, t it will, you know, it takes good culture change and social change work to get us there. We're, we're um, and so the question is, you know, we have this vision for the future where our families, our homes are more peaceful. How do we get from where we are today uh, to where, to that vision? And so there's lots of examples. There's lots of communities where this is happening um, very successfully, and I'll tell a short story, Ben. I'm ready. Years ago, I attended a conference, and there was a group at the conference, a group of young people, they were teenagers. They were brought there by a community center that they were a part of in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And this was in a Hispanic neighborhood. And in that community center, which was led by the brilliant Julia Perea, who recently died, recently passed, but she had, she understood that in that community, uh, the police were never gonna be called when there was violence. There were lots of issues that were the, the, the supporting the violence, the, the backbone of the violence, not the least of which is racism, you know, in, in the community, Tra intergenerational trauma, and all the things that go with that. Uh, and um, she also knew that nobody was ever going to, um, the families were never going to break up. They weren't going to, you know, they were going to stick together. This was a value. So they had a, they had a, a session every Tuesday night where the kids would come and go to a group for the kids. Moms would go to support group and dads would go to domestic violence accountability programming. And then they have a potluck. And everybody came together, the community came together. And oh, with, so in that model, there was, a, there was a community standard around holding, using social constructs to hold the violent partner, the dad usually, accountable. And I mean, I think that there's, I think there's communities that are doing that kind of thing right here in Vermont, where I've never heard of. There, well, it's not organized. It's not, you know, there's no stamp of, uh, there's mm -hmm. no 501c3 that are doing it. It's, it's how do we, how do we implement, how do we operationalize, how do we um, use our community values, our family values, our values around valuing each other, all those things, to help this person change their behavior. Wow. I think that happens all the time. Well, well, that's great. But what could be, do, what, what if anything should be done to encourage this? 
Well, there's really good models. So um, formally, what I just described might be called transformational justice. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, here in Vermont, we're really taking a hard look at the use of restorative justice mm -hmm. practices mm -hmm. in cases of domestic violence. We're in conversations with all kinds of folks, restorative justice practitioners, the Department of Corrections, um, folks across the country are experts at this. And we're trying to think of how do we create a system here in Vermont where certain people that meet certain criteria that come to the attention of a community because they're causing harm in their family can receive not just um, can, can not just accountability, which you know we in our movement is code word for punishment. So how can we hold them accountable for their actions while simultaneously recognizing that it's likely that they're trauma survivors? Mm -hmm. So there's a healing aspect to it. Mm -hmm. There's a relationship building, a community building aspect to it. And there's also um, a restoration as aspect to it. So how do, we, how, do we, um, how do we help these folks to recognize the harm they're causing and to repair it? And I think that holds a really great promise, really great promise. Now, I have to tell you, I was part of a group of people that pa helped pass a law in our state um, several years ago that in, that precluded the possibility that a domestic violence case could go into a restorative justice program. I forgive you. I've changed my mind. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> changed my mind about it. Clearly. And so, so that's, you know, there's, there's many pathways that we have to really be exploring. And mm -hmm. the wisdom that sits in this conversation, in this question, sits with survivors and the people that are causing them harm, both of those folks. And, and we can do a better job of, of engaging engaging those people and a lot of this work is happening in marginalized communities here because they because they're not going to call the police marginalized communities what different ethnicities or different uh, african-american communities uh immigrant communities uh you know in vermont of course our our, our biggest you know minority our biggest marginalized communities lgbtq community so all so this is happening in those communities it's um often you know just not that visible oh i clearly Clearly, you know, I, I just think, I keep, I've said this so many times, I'm getting tired of hearing it. <laughs> I, I just think that so many, so often I think, each case is unique to its facts. Mm -hmm. And, they're, and they're, to say that the only way to, to deal with this is through the criminal justice system is, it's obvious that not every case should go through the criminal justice system. Right, right. But there should be combinations of things. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to tell you, well, I used to try to see if, if a short hit was appropriate. Mm -hmm. And a short hit was, if I saw there's going to be a long-term problem, I thought that at least there should be a reminder that punishment is possible. Mm -hmm. So I make a very short jail sentence. Mm -hmm. Put him out on five years of probation with the understanding that there's going to have to be cooperation with the council and someone providing support. And, but you've got to have resources. <laughs> well, that's you, just it. you got to have resources. That's just it. I don't know if you ever knew about Judge Sontag's pro program down in the southern part of the state. No, I think this is after you were in that period of time, you know, you take these little breaks from, <laughs> from work. Um, he ran a program first in Bennington County and then in Wyndham County, mm -hmm. and it was a domestic violence docket. Mm -hmm. And so, it, and the idea was to shorten the, the length that the case was live and to immediately push folks in to make referrals. Uh, but you know, for the, for the person who's accused of doing harm, it was more of a push. Uh, mm -hmm. to push them into treatment and Condition other... Condition of set, uh, release. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, they, and it involved the, uh, the whole uh, gamut of community-based services. So not only was it um, the organization called PAVE in Bennington County and Women's Freedom Center in, in Wyndham County, but also their drug and alcohol treatment systems, their... Um, I'm trying to think of the other, the, there was, you know, there was, it, what they tried to do was to really recognize the mental health system, recognize what was going on within that family and recognize what was going on for that harm doer and get them into services and help and have them complete some treatment mm -hmm. and then come back and let's see what happens. They also had to do batteries accountability programming. So they, they had to do a lot in order to, to, to be diverted from a sentence. To stay out of jail. Right. Right, yeah. but um, but the you know it, the outcomes were pretty great. There were things were moving quickly, and um, issues were being resolved satisfactorily. Satisfactorily, and unfortunately, um, the the energy was really Judge Suntag's energy, and when he retired, the system just 
just it wasn't able to stay. It happens. Keep going. Yeah. It yeah. happens. I don't know. You know. I don't know why. Some of these some of these things that are so successful, you wonder why they don't become more widely, you know, right. a, a, adopted. Well, know. money. <laughs> well, that you know that is. Boy, you really touched me with that one. You know, uh, in my brief stay in the legislature in 2017, when the uh, Trump tax cuts came into effect, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the wealthiest one percent in Vermont got a 239 million dollar tax cut per year. Mm -hmm. I've gotten more than half a billion dollars more because of this tax cut. And I had proposed in the legislature that we should increase the progressive income tax mm -hmm. to recapture some of this money because we have all these things that we need to address. And I was in a room with 90 other legislators. Mm -hmm. There was utter silence in the room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's it, the money, the resources, it's very difficult. You've got to be able to pony up that money. Well, this is the paradox of, of the time of COVID. You know, this is the, our observation six months in, is that um, things that we thought weren't possible mm -hmm. suddenly are. And, um, <laughs> I mean, I think right now, you know, our legislature is hard at work and our governor is hard at work trying to figure out how to uh, maintain the integrity of our economy, maintain services, deal with COVID, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, deal with the situation in Mississippi where so many of the, the people that are from Vermont have now have COVID uh, who are imprisoned there. And um, what, 80% of them or something? 80, I think it's something like 80% of the people mm -hmm. who are housed in that facility have COVID. That's staggering. Yeah. And, you know, that's not, this is in Mississippi, not in Vermont. So let's make that really clear. But these are Vermont prisoners being held out of state because there is, isn't enough uh, prison space in Vermont for them. I understand that many of them are coming back now. Oh, they're totally right there. Yeah, yeah. totally right there. Well, I just, I just think it can't be we're going to have jails or we're not going to have jails. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. There's got to be uh, individual judgment. It's, it's, yeah. it's the kind of thing that you do as a judge. You have to take each case and its facts. Mm -hmm. and you have to consider all these standards and then you have yeah. to try to get a solution that's appropriate to that case. I can't remember if you and I have talked about the women's prison. This is a particular area of interest for me because, you know, just about 100% mm -hmm. of the women who we house in, in the prison, you know, just over the hill, mm -hmm. uh, are have experienced domestic and sexual violence in their lives. I didn't know that. And so we, we operate, the network operates a program called Divas inside the prison. Of course, we're standing right outside the prison now mm -hmm. uh, and talking to people on the phone. Because, and we all, so we do advocacy work inside the women's prison. And, you know, it, it, the women's prison is a, is a really interesting place. We have built, we, long ago we built a system inside the women's prison so that any woman who's housed there could have this array of services. And it, everything from advocacy around um, violence, domestic and sexual violence, to vocational services, to education, to um, support for parents, for mothers. I mean, really this beautiful array of services, mentoring to help people come back into the community and succeed. Oh, that's very important. The thing that we did though, was when we, when we made all of these services available inside the prison without thinking about access to those services outside pr the prison, is we created kind of this vortex for women who had um, deep needs, many of them suffering from addictions, trauma, the place where they could get the best services was inside the prison. And so this pa this pathway was created. Oh, I didn't see it. Yeah, so, you know, we, we grew the women's population, the, women's, the number of women who we imprison in our state exponentially mm -hmm. within the course of about a decade. And, the, and, and we had plenty of room. They used to be housed up at the Northwest facility. And, um, and the vast majority of the women that we housed then and who we house now here at the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility have, um, have committed crimes that are, you now you will get into arguments about what a violent crime, what constitutes a violent crime. But when you think about the crimes that they're committing, they're committing crimes related to addictions, related to tr ongoing trauma, ongoing violence. So they're writing bed checks, they're shoplifting, they're stealing. Some of them get into, you know, fist fights. They're, you know, they're, they're, but they're homeless. They're, um, they don't have access to the supports, basic supports. They're involved with DCF because of addictions and because of all these things. 
and um, and and then so then we move them to the Chittenden Regional Correctional. And TCF program. is the Department of Children and Children families. and Families. So their so their their involvement in, has to do with how they're treating their kids. The um, the average age of of the women who are housed in our by our state in the facility is 22 years old. 22. 22 years old. You go to that facility and visit that facility, and the, I'm looking around, and they're kids. They're they're teenage girls, and um, is they, this really a lot to do with drugs. Lots to do with drugs. The, the, they've had everything happen to them that you could imagine happen to them. We now have a commissioner, James Baker, uh, of the Department of Corrections, who has taken a really hard look at the, at the facility, and he has publicly stated we need to close the facility. The facility itself is not built for long-term housing. But, but you know, our folks who work on the inside, and they know all the women who live there, they, what they've said is, you know, we've probably got 10 to 15 women who've done things that would make you wonder if they would be safe out in the community. Mm. They've done pretty bad things. Mm -hmm. the rest it would of, harm others. Yeah. The rest of the women that are housed, are, are they're actually people who need services. And if they had access to services and stable housing, they... They wouldn't be in jail. They would not be in jail. And then we have this system of furlough, and I don't want to go into too much, you know, jargony detail, but we have a system right now where people get... I'll try to interrupt you. Okay, good. Because, you know, I can get going. Mm -hmm. See, I'm winding up. Um, we have a system of furlough that was designed for all the right reasons and all the good reasons, but it's created a, a, a cyclical um, this cycle for women who are released on furlough. It has very, the standards for being able to stay outside of the facility are very narrow. And they include things like she lost her job or she lost her home. Now these are not things that are illegal. Mm -hmm. But if that happens, then Go back to jail? She goes back to jail. And so they're, they're in and out that and in so and out. Stupid. And every time, every time they're released and out into the community and then brought back in, uh, anything, any progress that they would made is interrupted. So we're really thinking about different ways to do this. Well, one would hope, yes. And um, <clears throat> the, the, the state of Vermont, in its wisdom, and I'm very genuine about saying its wisdom, brought in the Council of State Governments last year. And they did a comprehensive review of the of the Department of Corrections and the, and the and systems, and um, and they focused in on the the women who we house, and their recommendation is that we rebuild this furlough system and and focus energy and focus um, resources on supports in the community. Okay. So I'm I, you know I'm very hopeful about that. Well, where is the uh, sorry I don't mean to recruit, but no no that's where's a good the money question. Come from? Well, so it's a it's a reinvestment of the money that we spend currently to bring people in and out of prison, to house people in prison, which is very, very expensive. I think the number I think is $88 a day, does that make sense? Um, and uh, and so by having fewer people in prison, we will save money. Now we've done this once before and it worked. It, it was, we, we created a whole new set of policies and, um, and by and large, that was the first time we decreased, the first big decrease of, of prison population and so, the state invited these folks back again um, from the Council of State Governments to do this review, and so we think that there's real possibilities for for, um, for reducing populations and, and getting the services out in the community that we need. Well, I just think the immediate I think the immediate concern I have is where are they going to live? You're going to put them out of jail? Where are they going to go to a hotel? They're going to go, where, where are they going to go? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a big question. Street corner? I mean, what, we, what? we have to create housing here. We have to do that. And that's, that's money. And I don't know where that money comes from. Maybe from the tax on folks who have second homes here. Well, you know, <clears throat> I, I, I just think, I, I, I can think of $239 million a year that's obviously immediately available. But uh, the inequities of the distribution of wealth and income mm -hmm are becoming more and more broad. I mean, they're bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. This separation of, of wealth is awful. But that's a gl and that's a global issue. Oh, that's yeah, well, just here in Vermont. Yeah, right. Well, that, that, and that's complicated because there are 50 states and there's a national standard and an individual. But I, I just think within, the, within our, our little state, mm -hmm. we, could, we could do much more in terms of equitable distribution of income and, and wealth. And you know, you're not like, what I, Always, I bridle at the thought that a proposal of a tax increase means you're going to take away all their money. 
Well, that's, right. that's silly. You're talking about a, a small percentage increase in taxation. Mm -hmm. But when I discuss this with the people, they say, oh, well, the rich will leave the state. And I, and I think to myself, oh, I'll help them pack. I mean, what are you talking about? You're going to pay 10% more tax, so you're going to leave? Get right. out of here. Come on, stop. And, you know, it benefits all of us. Right. It, it benefits all of us. Well, you know, we so often look to the Nordic countries, right, as a model for Vermont. And mm. one of the things that we know about the Nordic countries is they have a much higher tax rate oh, yeah. than ours, than our tax rates. And they they certainly have, they have problems. You know, oh, yeah. you know, I have a friend who says, well, you've got people, you got problems. <laughs> uh, the, um, but the, but the, you know, the reality is that one of the things that we haven't done is actually create a vision for our, you know, create a really solid understanding of what's happening right now. So the thing that the, the thing about Vermont is that our because of our rural nature, poverty is often really well hidden. Mm. You know, it's hidden by trees and mountains. Mm -hmm. And if you drive, you know, the back roads of the Northeast Kingdom, you drive the back roads of Orange County, you drive the back roads of all the, you know, any place in Vermont, what you're going to find are people that are living in um, very difficult situations. You can see from the road. They're shacks. Right, right. And, um, and so I think what we have to really be talking about is, is, uh, is a recognition of, you know, that this is a problem here. This is impacting um, Vermont families and Vermont communities. And, you know, our, our Vermont values are about caring for each other. So we have to then create a vision for what that well, looks like. Well, I, I don't think they're universal. I, I don't well, think there's a universal I'm, quality. You know, I'm an optimist, Ben. Yeah. I, I always want to see the best in people. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I spent a lot of my time looking at the worst, so I know, you, know, I know. you understand. Yeah. Yeah, you understand. Well, what would you think would help? I've, I've been concerned because I've seen over the years people have told me about really dreadful acts of violence that are never mm -hmm. reported. Yes. And is there anything we could do to get more reports so that the kinds of, not just criminal justice system, but other things mm -hmm. could become engaged? Well, you know, you're right. The, if we take a look at the, the Vermont, Vermont has a um, Domestic Violence Fatality Review Commission, and they look at domestic violence fatalities every year. They, they uh, take testimony from, from surviving family members, and they put out a report. And um, year after year, we learn a couple things. This is, is, almost, is true almost every year. Most of the people who are killed in domestic violence homicides have never called the police and they don't have any contact with any of our member organizations. They haven't gone into shelter. They, they've lived in severe isolation. No surprise. No surprise because their partners are, uh, you know, the most dangerous. And they know that. And they know that they'll, that they'll if they call the police, that there'll be, that it also presents risk, mm -hmm. heightened risk for them and often for their them. children. Yeah. So, um, so the other thing is that 50% of the homicides in our state are committed with a firearm. Year after year, after yes. year. Yes. So we've been working on legislation. You know, we don't want to take guns away from anybody. And of course, that's what you hear. You know, they want to take our guns away. We don't want to take guns away from anybody except for somebody who pours, propo poses a risk of killing their partner. Mm -hmm. And so we have the technology to understand who those people are, not only through uh, through you know the the um, issuance of a protection order the and the the affidavit that goes with that mm -hmm. the description of the violence the pattern of violence mm -hmm. we have lots of research now mm -hmm. to understand who are the most lethal um, of all abusers and we have we have um, validated tools that uh, police officers can use for checking on uh, the lethality. The likelihood of lethality in a survivor. It's a very simple tool. It's called the lethality assessment protocol, and police officers will ask a series of just 11 questions. And if the, if the survivor answers yes to six of those questions, the research shows that there's a much greater risk that that survivor is at risk for being killed. And then a whole series of things can happen. So, you know, a whole series of things you mean? Well, we can arrest the perpetrator. We can, uh, you know, we understand that. Uh, we need to be able to offer the survivor shelter and other kinds of services that... Uh, the are those, sir, I'm, don't need don't to be rude, but yeah. are those services available? They are. They are. And there is a, there, you know, the, the great thing about this, this tool is that police officers also love it because it gives them a really concrete way to get to the, to the, to the crux of risk in that moment, it's, they administer it at the site of a domestic, uh, when they go out on a domestic call. 
That doesn't get to your question about how do we get more people to to report. Mm -hmm. I think that there's, I mean, I, you know, I think that we have to really explore what we mean by reporting. Do, you know, does that mean we're reporting to the police or does it mean we're reporting, we're seeking help in other ways? You know, we have community councils who, uh, you know, similar to the, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the COSA model, the circles of support mm -hmm. and accountability. So we have, so we have those in place in communities. Uh, we have, we have uh, different mechanisms in communities where we're building relationships among community members to down, to decrease some of the isolation, and we're um, we're not washing our hands of this issue. So, so in my you know when we aligned ourselves and our movement mm -hmm. with the criminal justice system, and in, in effect, what we said was, please recognize that this is a problem in our society, and we presented all the documentation mm -hmm. and all the statistics and all the things mm -hmm. uh, and let us take care of it us and the police mm -hmm. will take care of this for you and I think that was a fundamental mistake because first of all we denied the voices of all the people that were saying the police are not the place where I see myself getting help but we also you just ignored that we just ignored it we just ignored it uh, and we, but we also said this is a problem that is uh, a family problem. It's a problem that's 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 happens one person and one person at a time. Mm -hmm. We 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 put a wall up between the relationship between the acts of of a, a person using violence and control and their survivor, the individuals, and the society that supports that violence. So now we're in this place in our movement where we're trying to course correct. Where we're trying to go back out to communities and say... This is the crossroads. This is the crossroads, yeah. Going out to the communities and saying, we, we can't do this alone. We can't do this alone. And actually, not only does it impact all of us, we actually all participate in it. We are participating in a culture, including me, that supports violence. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's intertwined. Intertwined with racism and with xenophobia and with uh, you know transphobia and, and and heterosexism and and it's all intertwined it's all intertwined and it feels huge huge but I still think that um, what's important for us to do is to create a vision and people will know what to do to make that vision happen well I'm you know I've had to you know I I, I got this uh, when I saw this great mind in the business. This what's his name? Gellis. Gellis, I think is Gellis, what he's saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw he, he recently passed away, and the obituary mentioned this book, mm -hmm. which I got a hold of. And <clears throat> thing that, that confounds me is the uh, the effect on children. Yep. And the, and the fact that I mean, so many kids grow up with physical violence directed at them. Yes. You know, they're they're hit with a belt. Or I used to get whacked with a fraternity battle when I was eight years old. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I think it had a profound effect of which I'm not really conscious. But Agreed. It, it, it really. You and I grew up in the era of not only is it okay to hit your kids, you should. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh no, it was it was a responsible parent. Yes. Who would yeah. hit the kid? Yeah. And and I just think this is a profound cultural problem mm -hmm. that violence has been. It's been thought of as a, as a good thing, when right. it really is not a good thing. It's just awful. It's not. It's just awful. Yeah, it's not. So what we're talking about here is a profound cultural change mm -hmm. at a time when there's family disintegration. Mm -hmm. And it puts, uh, it puts a real burden on the community and the school system. Yes. It's very yes. difficult. And to say that the school should now take over the process of uh, uh, raising kids and acculturing them, mm -hmm. I bridle against that. I mm -hmm. mean, why should the why should the school be telling my kid how I should behave? It's yeah. a very complicated problem. It is a complicated problem. I just saw some data yesterday coming out of um, New Hampshire, and they showed the number of um, reports mm -hmm. for child abuse mm -hmm. uh, over the course of these last six months. And uh, you know, the, so the the chart the chart looks like this. Mm -hmm. And then you hit March, and the number of reports drops. And they're starting, but because it's schools closed, right? And so the vast majority of reports are coming to, to schools. I, I mean, I have to say, I think that reporting is important. It's 
and it's also important what happens after reporting. And so, you know, Mr. Gallus, he did, you know, a 180 mm -hmm. and went from let's not, you know, let's work with families, and then he worked with a child or a couple kids who are severely abused, and he changed his mind, and then he became the, the primary driver of um, we have to remove kids. Put them in foster care. Yeah, yeah. And we know that system is also... I mean, I know some great foster parents, and but we also know it's a, it's a difficult system. And it's not just the quality of the foster parents. It's sometimes it's the problems that, 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 sure. that they're, they're, they're dealing with are very difficult. Sure, sure. Very hard. It's a lot. Yeah, it's hard. It's a lot. It's but think of how things have changed since we were kids. Mm -hmm. They've changed incredibly since we were kids. Well, they have in many ways. In many ways. I just think that the the number of single parents now and the, the breakup of the family and the deterioration of the concerned parent, number of concerned parents mm -hmm. is causing us all a great deal of grief. It's really hard. Yeah, I think that there's, uh, I mean, I think that simultaneously when you think about the arc of what you're talking about, that at the same time we've also seen um, the gutting of the social safety net. You know, mm -hmm. so think about funding even in our state and how that's and so and so what sits behind those dollars are services yeah and we've seen regular the, the erosion of the, the availability of services i can remember you know welfare of reform under the, under president clinton and the impact of doing away with the educational allowance on single moms mm -hmm. so they went from being able to go to school mm -hmm. to get an education go to college or go to a technical school to fulfill their obligation under uh, when they were on welfare, mm -hmm. to having to do false work, you know, they, they had to go work in an office or do filing or do, and uh, what a loss, what a huge loss, because I know in our organization we helped a number of women go to school uh, who were you, who are on you know um, who on welfare at the time got degrees and then got jobs and became self-sufficient in a matter of you know 18 months, two years. Well, you know, it's a terrific loss. So this this thing about single parenthood, single moms, those burdens, they're 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 out there on their own, and that's not good for us. That's not good for our society. It's not good for our communities. So when you talk about people don't want to have their taxes raised, you know, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's we don't want to pay for somebody on welfare to to go to school, but we'll pay eighty eight dollars a day for them to be in prison. <laughs> yeah, values. Mm -hmm. 